is this working? Yay.
Yeah. 
think I checked it before. Do you want to, can you look and can you put it up your computer? Okay. making sure the live stream is working.
Yeah, I guess these jokes are all target. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> I promise that's the last one. Okay. Um, up and coming, uh, these should be released really soon. Um, as you think Jordan talked to Drew Envy about his Technic Genes project. We've talked about this previously in the past with the native people. Essentially, BioBricks is teaming up with Twist to deliver 10,000 genes for the public. Um, we are actually going to have a meeting uh, in early October to sort of brainstorm together some genes that we think would be really great to supply to this project. So keep your uh, eyes peeled on your email for information about that. Uh, it'll probably be some evening during the week, and we'd love to have a great crowd there to try to suggest some uh, ideas. And then they also interviewed Carmela Haynes about some of the work that that lab at Arizona State has recently done in um, permanent engineering for uh, cancer therapies. Uh, so that's the podcast update. Uh, some, some information just about kind of what's going around the world of synthetic biology. If you do not get as many emails from John Cumbers as I do, then <laughs> you're lucky. Uh, but the uh, Symbio Beta, which is, uh, uh, is holding the conference, I think it's in about a week and a half. Now, um, in San Francisco, their, their annual conference where a bunch of you know Symbio uh, companies uh, and, and startups get together and talk about the field. You can see it's a pretty impressive list of companies on there. You've got the keynote from Ginkgo, uh, a bunch of a bunch of different other aspects here. So you've got uh, companies like Synthetic Genomics, uh, IDT, Thermo Fisher. Probably the real highlight is going to be as they keep on advertising it. You know, the fireside chat between George Church and Benad Kosla. Um, they're going to be talking about how sort of the intersection of big data could potentially uh, influence synthetic biology. Uh, more in the news. Uh, so I found this in the New York Times. Um, so I think last month uh, uh, Jordan talked about the new CAR T cell treatment that finally got approved by new artists. Uh, really exciting for treating leukemia. Um, they're saying it's going to cost four hundred seventy-five thousand dollars, though. So that's that's pretty uh, a high sticker price. What I thought was interesting actually was that this uh, this author Gina Kalata, the same day this article came out, published a similar follow up article. What does it cost to create a cancer drug? And it was an opinion piece talking about how it's actually a little bit less expensive than you would think. So that might be a real roadblock to try to get in some of these carbon treatments <coughs> approved. Is that actually for some therapeutics that cost is going down? Um, if you're more interested about this, I'll plug my terribly uh, shot photo of the economists uh, from the past week uh, actually had a highlight on cancer therapeutics and uh, more into the policy behind how the, how the current piece stuff is going, which is interesting. Um, I put this in here because when Isaac sent me this link, this was the first thing that popped up and I almost screamed. Um, <laughs> anyone know what this is? It's a good cop -up. What is it, Isaac? It's a cockapoe. It's a cockapoe, which you either know if you troll synthetic biology uh, news, or you watch an obscene amount of animal planet most extreme during your youth, like I did. Um, the cockapoe is an endangered New Zealand parrot. Um, and some people, I guess about three or four years ago, decided that it would be a really great project uh, to try to see if we could sequence the genomes of all of the living cockapoes. Back then, there were, I think, 120 of them. The cockapoes are actually doing better. There's up to about 150. But they just finished the project, um, and they're saying that this is like could be really potentially useful because you would have you know the entire genome of the organism, all of the different uh, different individuals, and maybe that could inform things like how can we prevent the species from going extinct. I think they just did it because they wanted to. Um, <laughs> apparently, cockapoes are you know rebounding though. This is going to be a good breeding year. So, yay. <laughs> um, Craig Better did not have a good month. Uh, we'll get to that again later, but uh, one, of the, one of the big uh, things that happened was uh, uh, synthetic genomics affected by a gender discrimination suit from two uh, former female employees who claimed that they were discriminated against. This comes kind of in the wake of a uh, similar story that happened at the Salk Institute in July, where uh, a couple of female scientists uh, uh, sued the Salk because they claimed that their firing was due to uh, discriminatory reasons. Uh, which maybe has some real merit. Interestingly, the, the person that's in charge of the Salk Institute, Elizabeth Blackburn, you might know she discovered full um, uh She, along with the Salk, sort of published a, uh, an explanatory letter to the press saying that they fired these people because they didn't do good enough science. And literally, in the article, it said, like, did not publish enough in Nature Science and Cell, given, like, one of the people that was fired is in the National Academy of Sciences, so. Yeah, it's not looking great there. Uh, the good thing, though, if you don't want to, if you uh, want to have the brighter view, I guess, of, of how the field uh, is treating women, um, 
John Cooper's really wants you to know that there are a lot of female entrepreneurs in synthetic biology. Uh, they're advertising a bunch of people that are bringing pockets in bio beta, uh, female entrepreneurs in space. Uh, and there was also this interesting article I found in Van Fair uh, talking about Zymergen and how it's actually kind of blocked a lot of the trend in the Silicon Valley uh, area of having the programmers. Um, they've been able to recruit a lot of females to work in that space. Um, this one's for my mom, uh, who always tells me that, you know, investment is important in the uh, life sciences. I just thought this article was hilarious because it says, the obscure uh, life sciences subsector with companies you've never heard of, like Thermo Fisher. Um, <laughs> I've heard of it, I guess. Uh, uh, pointing out that it's actually having a great year. So if you want some stock advice, like, talk to someone that knows, not me. But uh, uh, these, these companies uh, in, in the sector are doing better than you know, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Um, and then finally, Wired posted an interesting article. This is also sort of producing bio beta. I think um, uh, this is going to get announced there. Uh, is uh, a partnership between Bayer and Dinko Bioworks to try to engineer new nitrogen fixing bacteria. So nitrogen fixation, for those that aren't aware, uh, essentially it occurs through symbiotic bacterial relationship with plant roots. And this is really good because they can fix atmospheric nitrogen and create uh, nitrates in the soil that could potentially replace fertilizers. The problem is that rhizobia, which are the bacteria that do it, aren't really very hardy. They don't live on a lot of uh, different plants. So Ginkgo is basically doing the Ginkgo thing and let's just screen all of the bacteria and see if we can get something that works. Um, so that could potentially have, have uh, some real defense. They are bottom of but that's why. Yeah, yeah. Um, on to the research talks. Uh, so this paper in Cell came out, uh, interestingly talking about microsat repeat expansion diseases. So these are things like Huntington's disorder, um, some myotonic dystrophies are caused by, essentially, when the, when the genome is being replicated, um, you get uh, sort of uh, inauspicious additions of codons to coding sequences of genes, and these can wind up folding in really un undesirable ways. Um, so Huntington's, I think, is probably the most famous example of this, is you get these CAG repeats. Um, so this group used uh, an RNA-targeting Cas9 to knock down the expression of these aberrant uh, RNA phenotypes, and were able to dramatically decrease the expression of these RNAs that are associated with diseases. Um, up on BioArchive, I actually think it has been officially published in Nature since I made this slide, um, but uh, the Dabna Lab publishes on an enhanced proofreading uh, Cas9, so there's been a lot of talk, I think, recently about off-target effects with, with uh, gene editing. This is a protein, they did some single molecule threat studies on the protein to figure out actually a mechanism for how you can get mismatch mutations in a Cas9 protein. And it turns out if you make these three targeted mutations in the REC3 site of the Cas9 protein, um, it prevents sort of the mismatch repair, or it prevents allowing mismatches to be created by the protein. And you can see, for instance, up there in that cluster one, you get a lot less off target uh, uh, editing. That was the one. Um, Craig Benner makes another appearance. Uh, so this, this paper made all the rounds uh, on the social media. Uh, it was a paper published in PNAS about identifying individuals uh, using whole genome sequencing. So, naively, this is a really cool idea. Essentially, what they say is you, know, you can take a person's genome sequence, do some deep, uh, some machine learning algorithms to try to piece out what are the pieces of the genome that make someone's face what it is, and then they say that they can actually predict someone out of a lineup, you know, use, verifying their system. Um, I actually thought some of their stuff that they did was really cool. So, for instance, they were able to infer people's ages by looking at telomere length and looking at like the amount of mosaicism in a, in a female chromosome. Um, the problem is that like it didn't really work at all. Uh, <laughs> so, two hours after that paper came out, Yannick Ehrlich, who's pictured here, you might remember it better. It was a couple months ago the guy that published the DNA Fountain paper in encoding um, uh, in encoding information to DNA. Uh, two hours later, publishes, like, you guys done screwed up here. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of great lines in this paper. I think the, the most interesting one, though, I don't know if you can see the resolution on the back here, so they take these images of, you know, the true people's faces and then what the algorithm predicts them to be. And you'll notice that all the predicted ones, like, they're generic white male faces, and they all look exactly the same. Um, so that's not great. 
Uh, apparently the first author like acknowledges on Twitter that most of the variation that they see between populations is literally meaningless, and you can, all of the inferences that the people make could essentially be broken down by sex, age, and ethnicity, all of which is like generally in databases anyway. The original paper did like this great job of talking about how we need to be, you know, we have to really make sure this uh, technology doesn't get out of hand because it's violating people's privacy and everything. And uh, Yannick Uri like, is basically like, I mean, yeah, but it doesn't work. So, um, <laughs> Twitter had a field day with this, of course. Uh, if we can identify cases of machine learning, can we identify BS machine learning papers? Um, so I'm going to put this one out. <laughs> Uh, in all seriousness, it actually got kind of ugly, so Nature News then did a follow-up on this, and it turns out that science flat out rejected the paper because it didn't really make any sense. So Craig Fenner, who's in the National Academy, used sort of the privileges of being in the National Academy to publish in PNAS by picking his three reviewers, of whom it was two information privacy experts and a bioethicist, notably absent, like, a biologist, a statistician, people that will, you know, give that, that sort of feedback. Um, followed up to the early paper on bioarchive, this is sort of now becoming the thing, it's just people fighting on bioarchive over preprints, um, saying that there were no major flaws, sort of toned down the language and saying that like really what the real strength of this paper was, was being able to identify specific um, traits of the genome that you can predict that would then correlate to uh, <laughs> visual predictions. Um, Twitter still didn't really have, a feel, have fun with this, so. Uh, Benner posted, you know, oh, you know, my preprint is out now. Um, I think Yana Early says, why don't you block me on Twitter after this? Uh, um, Jovial Scientist, which is like a sarcastic blog, I like this, he uses millions of genomes to predict the sunrise. Um, but, you know, to, to fix Craig Benner's one, he did win the yachting competition. I saw that when I was <laughs> It's a dangerous game, by the way. <coughs> Back to actual science, um, Selfry had a good month, uh, so scientific reports, uh, this system, or uh, this paper about how to uh, produce in Selfry life states, in this case from Chinese hamster ovaries, sort of these difficult to express proteins. So things like antibodies they also did, which was pretty cool um, in an ion channel, um, so you can, you can sort of see how they're able to replicate an action potential, um, using this sort of, uh, this sort of contraption um, with the uh, continuous exchange system. Um, uh, Neuro Lab also published, and I think, I don't know if anyone's talking about that later, um, but uh, in Joe's in the Journal of Visual Experiments, uh, production of bacteria, full bacteria pages in cell free lysates. Um, I'm not exactly sure the difference, so hopefully someone can talk about this the difference between this and a previous paper they published in making P7. It sounds like they've sort of expanded the ability to do this to other phages as well, which is pretty neat. Uh, also on bioarchive, uh, you know, it's 17 years old and we're still talking about the repressor later. Uh, so this is a, a, a strictly computational paper about redesigning the repressor later. In this case, trying to see if you can get independent frequency and amplitude modulation. So if you give the repressor later one signal, it will oscillate like this, and then if you give the repressor later a different input signal, it'll go like this. Um, it's all computational. It's pretty interesting. I think the applications that they talk about for biosensing are a little bit. Say, but what do you mean? Uh, speaking of computational papers that I didn't really understand that are trying to maybe have uh, sort of stalwarts of synthetic biology, uh, there's a new version of our guest calculator out, also in bioarchive. Um, this was interesting because they sort of go down, and there's been a couple iterations of our guest calculator and similar sort of ilk. Um, so, uh, Sal's lab talks about developing this new metric that they call model capacity, which is supposed to sort of uh, allow you to take translation, translation initiation predictions across a whole bunch of different constructs and try to pick out like which calculator is really doing this the best because not all of them are perfect. And using those uh, those results, they also added a couple new free energy terms to the calculator and were able to develop a model that they said works better than anything previous. I haven't actually been with our base calculator since this came out, so I don't know if it's an option to use this not or yet, but. Um, NAR publishes a paper on RNA uh, circuit design. In, 
this case, uh, it's essentially using RNAs as, uh, as regulators where one RNA sort of acts as a cobalt into another RNA, which causes the structure to rearrange, and then they sort of build these like puzzle pieces where eventually you can get uh, uh, either occlusion or opening up of a ribosome binding site to activate uh, gene expression. Not like great fold activation, but it's pretty interesting and everything was done completely a short ago. Um, there were a couple papers along this line. Um, the first one I have here uh, is from the Alper lab. He actually talked about this when he was here last year, but it wasn't published yet. But this is their RNA actors and droplets approach for doing metabolic engineering. So essentially putting a rhizo switch inside of a droplet uh, so that you can sense inside of a droplet also so the cell is expressing the rhizo switch and is like a, a net producer of the ligand for the rhizo switch. And then you can sense in very high throughput potentially good, uh, good candidates uh, from the metabolic engineering. Um, another paper sort of similar. Uh, this time they were using pH sensitive ribo switches to evolve um, the, uh, acid tolerant microbes for, again, metabolic engineering purposes. This was uh, pretty neat because this is a, a ribo switch that's got. I would, get, I would say odd mechanism for most ribo switches. The fact that it's able to respond to a single pH shape I think is, is quite new. Um, and then similarly, there was this perspective piece in Nature Drug uh, drug Discovery, kind of talking about how you can use directed evolution for these ideas of making new drugs, things like um, uh, non ribosomal peptides or anything along those lines, uh, using like light down screens. And then I think this is the last paper I have on here. Um, Paper in PNAS talking about genome wide engineering of herpes viruses. Turns out herpes viruses are huge and they're like difficult to engineer. Um, but there would be a real, they, they express some expressions that might be really nice for therapeutic purposes like drug delivery. Um, but it's, it's really hard to do anything uh, anything with them specifically. So they use sort of a, a, an old approach of, you know, taking out the genome, putting it into pieces, then doing all the assembly and yeast and putting it back together. Um, but I thought what was interesting about this paper, again, was the sort of caveat at the end, like, yeah, we're sort of concerned that being able to engineer herpes viruses is dangerous, but, like, it could be useful, too. Yep, and I think that's it. So, any questions? Go for it. All right. Uh, if not, then I think I'm going to leave it up to Wes and Joe and Vaughn to talk about EPRC. things. Uh, they 
chose three uh, that are sort of of interest to the absent community. Uh, CPF1 is version up there, the E. coli version is called Cascade, it has various different subunits that work together, uh, SP Cas9 uh, as well. Basically, what they found is that they can make these functionally in vitro, which is cool. And then they can uh, actually show differences. Uh, you see, like, it has this targeting and non targeting. So, if you have a target, like a DFP for SM protein in cell 3 that you normally make, uh, if you target that sequence, you can knock it back, right? So, you can actually see differences of when uh, you successfully targeted that gene and when you didn't. Uh, and then they show that basically this can be used to predict uh, things in, in vivo as well. So, in living E. coli, you can use those same. Uh, sequences to target uh, expression in living E. coli, you can guide your in vivo uh, methods as well, least lethal. So that's pretty cool. Uh, secondly, they found uh, that you can quantify activity of anti CRISPR proteins. So if you want to screen like a million anti CRISPR proteins, which are all the rage these days, uh, that would be a good way to do it. And then they have this cool workflow where they do high throughput sequencing of, uh, so basically they dump in like a whole library of PAM sequences. Um, which are the, the spots that are targeted by, by CRISPR proteins. Uh, and then they add their uh, endonuclease uh, of, of various kinds. And then they can actually get a better insight into the PAM sequence in, in high throughput. So this is like a full library basically asking what is the PAM sequence of some of these lesser known versions of, uh, of CRISPR proteins. So pretty cool stuff there. Um, so and then another talk that I wanted to uh, discuss, really cool story uh, from Monica McNary uh, from the Sosinski lab. Uh, and this, they've been working on this for a while. Uh, it's been kind of a long uh, go at it, but they're making some real progress on making a, a zinc uh, deficiency biosensor from E. coli. Uh, and so basically the idea there is you would take like patient blood, you mix it with some E. coli cells with a certain, running a certain genetic program, you get various color readouts, like the visual color readouts, um, based on the amount of zinc in the blood. Issue in a lot of healthy countries uh, having zinc deficiencies as well as other autoimmune uh, diseases adapt this towards. And so they're using the lipopenine pathway to actually do this. Um, and in some ways, it, it was uh, nice to see someone actually talk about all of the like work you do to tune biological systems to make them work the way you need them to, including the sense of biosensors. You need the right dynamic range, you need like good off states, you need solid on states, you need them to happen fast, like all these things. And I thought this was a good, like, sort of honest recap of, of how it happens. Uh, and so what they did is they did like promoter tuning. Uh, some of you may be interested to know, like the PVAP promoter was the best in this case. And in particular, they made like a, a weakened version of the PVAP promoter, uh, which had the lowest off state and still a pretty high on state. And then they tuned browser binding sites to basically uh, get better uh, dynamic range on their on their reads. So this right there. Uh, finally, I wanted to highlight uh, Emily Hartman's talk. Uh, she is from the uh, you know, it's more like lab, and you can't talk about your own work, but I can talk about it because I think it's really cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so this, uh, she actually sent us uh, her slide deck and, and said we'd be able to share it, so it's pretty cool. It's, it's still uh, manuscript in preparation. Basically, it revolves around the engineering of the MS2 code protein, uh, and that's uh, one of the bread and butters of, of uh, Daniel's lab. Uh, and it's really cool, so I learned a lot about it. Uh, basically, it actually encapsulates uh, RNA and DNA on its own. Uh, so it's a really cool way to do like in vitro selections. Uh, and so what they did is they basically like mutagenized the whole protein and then saw which of those variants can continue to form uh, these co-proteins. And in one uh, famous case at this point, if you change a single amino acid, you like shrink the size of the particle a whole bunch. So you could like actually tune the biological properties of this thing with some pretty small changes. Uh, and so, like I said, I, I found it very interesting that you can actually uh, use it as its own selection scheme so you can actually tie genotype to phenotype because it can really wrap its genotype inside of its phenotype uh, as viruses are wont to do. And uh, they came up with this really cool fitness landscape of all the different amino acid variations uh, and then showed that their apparent fitness score from their vitro screen actually did correlate with virus like particle assembly. Uh, next, they used some really cool computational tools such as Shannon Entropy to show overall mutability of specific sites. Uh, so they find like around this uh, certain pocket, you have pretty high mutability, uh, <laughs> and then you can actually tie that to uh, certain, uh, or your low mutability actually. Um, so, and you can actually tie that to certain physical properties too. So you can have like specific mutability to certain types of amino acids, uh, which I think is a useful way to start thinking about some of uh, Other highlights, um, again, these are just like broad strokes. 
Uh, the Bones Lab at MIT is continuing to expand Sherlock, as you would expect them to, uh, but for new viruses. So uh, we've gone over that a little bit in the month before. Basically, it's a high sensitivity CAS based uh, RNA detection technique. Uh, the Monson Murray Lab in Emory uh, has some cool work on engineering insect microbiomes to protect bees from, uh, from pesticides. Uh, cool work there. Uh, the Haynes Lab is working on synthetic chromatin uh, vectors. Uh, and then the Taylor Lab at Bryce uh, basically has been working a lot on two component systems and their ability to make new biosensors. And so they're expanding that in some pretty cool bio prospecting uh, ideas for new two component systems, which is really definitely needed for, to make new uh, synthetic information. And with that, I'll leave it to the bottom. And uh, I'm Bun, and this person is Ashley Chapman. She's in Fin Lab at Georgia Tech, she's actually a chemistry lab. And she also does work on bars like particles and similar chemistry, which is what I work on. So this isn't what I do, but similar, you guys are cool. And so what they're really trying to do is use uh, bars like particles, in this case, Q beta, which is something they have to do. It's about 30 nanometers, and they want to use that as a carrier protein, and they want to conjugate glycans on the outside to use it as a vaccine. Do they want to use glycans because, I guess, traditionally, if you have a glycan to produce an antigen, it's not really, it doesn't produce a large immune response, and you're trying to produce the amount of immune response you get, you get by tethering it to this code protein. And so this is for a similar application. It's not really looking at the molecular linker on antigen and you just give you, give you in BLP conjugate carbohydrate vaccines, because the stuff being done right now is unpublished. I can't really talk about it. I can talk about some of the stuff that we've done in the past, and they've done it, I think this is for how does this year or something like that, where they've done it for the topic the uh, carbohydrate structure that they found the outside of that bacteria. They conjugated it to the parts of particle, they put it into mice, and they've seen it in the response. So that's something cool that I don't know. And so the next one is about uh, Carolina Kalbarzik. She's from RPI on Lab. And what they're really trying to do is that they're trying to engineer, I guess, uh, bacteria consortia to accomplish a specific task. We hear a lot about microbiome engineering, and that's really what, for more health related aspects. But in this case, they're trying to do it for a biotechnology like aspect, trying to produce a certain molecule coming from certain feedstock, using one bacteria to create that feedstock, having that treated out of it, and then using the other cell as a production vehicle. And so right here, basically, an overview of how they do this. Yeah, essentially they use E. coli and Bacillus and Megatarium, not necessarily in order, but they use it. And so they have it, and one of them comes in. They have, they, uh, have a signaling peptide that essentially gets shuttled out of it, and then it produces these pe piece of peptides called AIPs. These AIPs are sensed by another protein and another bacteria. And once it goes into there, you can uh, activate this other molecule, ARPA, and then ARPA, you can start producing something else. So I thought this was really cool. This stuff is also not published, but it seemed like it was about to be published. I thought it was a cool application. And so, this next part is what I'm going to talk the most about because they established this talk and most of the stuff is talked about was already published, except for a little bit. So basically, it says the high frequency approaches for engineering for cat proteins. And the first part I'm going to talk about is the high frequency part. So the second part is what I'm going to talk about is the class nine. And so basically, here's an overview of how they did this. So you have your plasmid, then you have a transposon, and you use a specific Transposase, and now the restricted cycle again. So you have to there and randomly insert the plasma in a lot of different places, but it's inside of the plasma for sort of being one compressed. Cut that out, and put it into the expression vector, and you're able to have a, a put it into the expression vector and into another cutting out to take out the transposon and put in the part that you want. And they did this because they were really interested in ligand binding. Domains and tacking to that protein to keep the activatable. So here is basically where they have uh, GSP on the left, and they have some kind of 
is up here, right here. That's activatable in, this, in the presence of the ligand. In the ligand. So they did that whole engineering process. And they identify which ones actually have functional GFP expression in the presence of uh, that functional GFP in the presence of the ligand. And then they use fats to you know, high throughput rate uh, sort which one works. If not, then you use an excess sequence to be able to see which one you so that was the high throughput part. Uh, then, yeah, on, on the input, he has uh, C as a product. Uh, and if you were to be there, you comment for some of the hands that's not the top. What they have the three and more since then? Yeah, so they have this part, and then they apply it to basically the whole experiment. They apply that to the S9. So then they basically essentially did the same thing that I just earlier, we have the Cas9, the whole boson process, to be able to put in a ligand binding uh, gene, a ligand binding protein into the Cas9 gene to see if it's functional. So here they are, they finally did this in the next generation of sequencing, and they identified parts of the Cas9 that are really amenable to these insertions. I think it's called, they call it GFC, I guess the main insertion protein, and then we add C to it. It. And so here it is, there's a uh, domain the insertion profile, not the domain insertion protein. And so here they are, they matched that with Cas9, they saw which areas were amenable to this, and then they did it prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells, and this right here for the prokaryotic cells, and HC is basically the ligand that they had and put the receptor to respond to, and it showed that there is a response with Cas9 if you add it. As you increase added, you get more activated Cas9. I don't know if it's but cutting out uh, GFP. And so this is for prokaryotic cells, and they also showed it again with, uh, oh, that's for, that was for prokaryotic cells, and this is for eukaryotic cells. And they showed that when you add it in the presence of ligand, you get the response. And then here's right here, the presence of Cas9. The ligand is still the same response, but it's not engineered to put the response. But when you engineer it for the other domain that responds to ligand, when you don't have it, you don't get cutting. But when you do, you do it, it shows that it works. Right. Then, the last person I'll talk about is Vincent Rowe. We talked about him a little bit earlier. And we did talk about the TXPL. We talked about that a lot. We did a lot of collaborations with a lot of different professors in the field, and it seems like it's really pushed to use these healthy systems, that biology is uh, interesting. This right here, I thought was the most interesting thing to talk about, is really trying to onward to create, to create a minimal cell. So this right here is a possible phospholipid vesicle, and in these vesicles, they encapsulate the cell free reactants. And so they show that after five hours, you do get expression of the uh, protein that you want, so you get some so the resistance is going on, and this right here is showing that you do get some kind of uh, budding, which I guess is a first step towards creating stem cells. It's not controllable, it's not perfect, but it does occur, so it's I that one. How did they do they express like proteins that do the circling and tightening thing for itself? Uh, the circling and tightening is not for the, it's not, the positive, not the protein itself. They, Vesicles that they would do that here in the solution. And so they are like expanding, but this is just showing that as it expands, you're still getting the uh, protein synthesis. So, uh,
same feel as before. I'll be talking about things that were published. Maybe I'll maybe you know, maybe for what's in the works right now, but hopefully not this is uh, um, I gave a talk at EDRC and I'm having like a terrifying flashback where my fingers didn't show up. So uh, if any if my fingers show up today, like this will be a success. That's all I want to do. Nice job. So the first person is uh, Young Jim Lee, a uh, graduate student from Utah at Washington. And what this last work has been doing is trying to uh, regulate gene expression in a very precise way uh, by developing RNA based devices. And so the idea that we're looking for is not just using one RNA device or multiple RNA devices, but multiple distinct types of RNA devices. So, for example, in this case, we short, they have a Cas9 and an sCRNA that are fusible, and then that regulates. But then separately, you have an antisense RNA that can act upon this sgRNA and essentially sequester it to get the So now we have distinct types of mechanisms all in one, and the goal is to be able to break dynamically and quickly without putting too much strain on the resources of the cell and get the cell going. So they're essentially taking this and applying it to new types of RNA and throwing that all in the same place. Okay, uh, next from the paper lab, but I think less than what you would do. Uh, Felix, I can just get a And uh, here they're taking these uh, proteins called two component uh, systems from bacteria. And how they essentially work is through natural modeling. So they, uh, in response to light, some other stimulus, uh, can become activated. And then on the lower half of this uh, barbell uh, cartoon, uh, these are DNA binding agents. So you can imagine this is like right for the picking in terms of swapping out domains and making new liquid apples. Uh, so they um, are doing just that. We'll tell you what they're putting out there. But uh, there are tens of thousands of these that have been bioinformatically mined. And now it's just like a screening process to see what are these proteins in nature that are predicted to look like this, what does it actually do, and what are the effects. So they either engineered or discovered there's a combination of those two uh, new versions of these proteins uh, that are really not what they're Something that wasn't talked about here, but was in a recent publication is that they can actually dynamically control the input uh, using some computation design to get desired waveforms. So if this is your target pattern of downstream expression, and you want to make, I don't know, for whatever reason, maybe it's just a fun thing, uh, but waveforms that vary in the amplitude, wavelength, and so forth, you can't, the input can't be that same wave. You have to like control for what it can actually be. So here, in your white uh, version here, they're showing you Stimulus that they predict is that gives rise to that way. So uh, you can make who was it who was talking about the oscillations? Was it that? Or the request layer. The request layer. Yeah. So this is not this is not closed loop, this is external control, but it's still pretty cool. Alright, I was very excited to meet Professor Melissa Tech. She is how I saw it, like the net of Bagaria equivalent. Georgia Tech. <laughs> um, and if Jessica Hughes is in the room, no, I'll have to tell her later. Um, but this is some like, really amazing stuff. So essentially, Dr. Kemp is in NSF Science and Technology Center, which unites professors from many different institutions towards some common goal. And it's basically, there are a bunch of these around the country, you've got five years and $25 billion of talent, it would be the impossible thing. And so the impossible challenge they propose, and I guess all these centers are trying to do this, is creating de novo synthetic multicellular organisms and understanding the mechanosensitive and differentiation or look at design rules that give rise to emergent behaviors and simulating it and um, all of the buzzwords. But they've actually made a lot of progress in this direction. I I I take only partial. Uh, so what they're doing here is what you're seeing in each of these seven different diagrams, we have an image uh, with some cells that are currently uh, proteins of different colors, and then on the right, an agent-based model simulation in 3D that's showing when you start out with just a clump of first-looking embryonic stem cells, one are just some very simple tools, another are like leather that you really do have control over, and corresponding experiments to your right. And so they can essentially examine how all of these different differentiated patterns for different tissues map onto different spaces and extract these features from the 
people I know, the people I see, that are really responsible for those things. So um, you really kind of see there's this morphogenic trajectory in this latent space um, for. It was really complex. It was really cool. It gets into this blood stuff. Um, and I don't know if Egypt's, the center is still going strong, but it seems like they've got over 100 publications on the website from this product alone, not the slap, but all these other things. So very proud of that. All right, uh, Carmela Haynes. Um, so a lot of us are familiar with pressure surfactants that work by a mechanism that we're all familiar with, which is simply, well, not simple at all, but canonically recognizing specific DNA sequence. Uh, the Haynes lab uh, is very interested in chromatin, uh, which I would distinguish from epigenetics in the subtle way that chromatin is the physical post translational modification. Epigenetics is more related to how it's inherited. What they want to do is recognize chromatin marks, um, such as natural chromatin stones, and see if they can use that rather than the underlying as the thing is the target for pressure treatments. So they took a look at these natural proteins that we all have in these uh, periodic systems for recognizing these marks. In wolf, a synthetic red pressure factor that essentially recognizes the protein mark for repression and activates transcriptive edit. So it's, it basically scans the entire genome for any gene that is repressed via this specific mark and then turns it off. So they followed this up with some genome scale transcriptome analysis and chromatin analysis and found that they could essentially activate a lot of the tumor suppressors that are really instrumental in genetic breast cancer um, and some other genes that are more on the way. So and they have a proposed mechanism for all the different parts that are working together to make this happen. And we talk about we talk to her a lot about this in the next podcast podcast episode. Got it? I said and we'll we talk we uh, talk to her just as a reminder for the podcast and a lot of her work with this, we will discuss, we discuss with her in depth. Great, so we'll hear, we'll hear more, more, more about this from the source. Yeah. Uh, I'm debating whether to show you the last thing. So, <laughs> there was a very brief, wonderful interlude between when the conference ended and my flight out to in which I had an hour to do anything I wanted to at that time. And so uh, there were just so many amazing opportunities. There was like a human and civil rights exhibit, named like the best aquarium in the world, um, all these like beautiful landmarks. And for whatever reason, we all decided to visit the Coca-Cola Museum, uh, which if you want to be inundated with over-the-top consumerism, this is the place for you. Uh, we were bombarded with free samples um, with no, it was kind of like a transformative experience in a way. I came out very disillusioned about the world. Um, <laughs> oh gosh, well, as you'll see in this image here, Weston is drinking the Coke in front of all these screens that are flashing ads. Uh, I don't drink Coke, so I'm just taking it for um, a long time ride. Um, they had this whole exhibit about trying to allude to what was the history of Coca Cola and, and this SpongeBob, Mr. Crab's esque manner of what's the secret formula. And they never actually revealed it. Uh, but you can look up more about what the true secret formula for America's most delicious, refreshing, exhilarating beverages. <laughs> so I thought, like, from the sublime to the ridiculous, the most amazing symbiote to um, all this wonderful stuff. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> and unless there are any questions or announcements, Hi guys, I'm Taylor, I'm from the Tumblr Nursing Lab. So uh, we actually just scheduled this awesome seminar for Tuesday, so we wanted to tell you all about it. Um, one of the visiting scholars slash researchers for our lab, his name is Jay Bevington, and he does space bio stuff. And he actually spent the last eight months doing the high, high seas mission, which is like the uh, simulated Mars environment on the side of a side of volcano in Hawaii. And so he's gonna come in on Tuesday at 10 a.m. and give a talk on kind of his experience, and while he was there, he was trying to do some like small biology experiments and how difficult that would be. So we wanted to invite all of you. I think I'll probably just send it out on the festival, but it's in Francis Searle, 10 a.m. on Tuesday, this upcoming Tuesday. So put it on your calendar and send out more information so you guys know. 